motion before the House tonight is this House believes that Conservatives have been unfairly demonised. Um, without further ado, to open the case for the proposition is Jesse Norman, who is a Tory MP and has written several books on Conservatism and is in the top 25 people to watch in 2012, according to the Times. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam President. It's a great uh, honour to be here uh, tonight. I understand that your glorious reign as uh, President uh, is going to culminate in further events with Dominique Strauss-Kahn uh, and Katie Price later this term, and I only hope that they will be able to cope with the sense of disappointment and anticlimax that they will be following this debate. <laughs> uh, I am a new MP, uh, and uh, I can tell you now uh, having seen the uh, Cambridge Union at close quarters, that uh, Parliament is but a very modest training for an appearance at this great uh, institution. Uh, I must say, I come to you with a sense of trepidation. I rather think of myself and my two very fine, upstanding colleagues here as uh, woolly mammoths treading cautiously in the primeval swamp, uh, only to aware that hundreds of young prehistoric tribesmen in loincloths are looking to bring them down and mount them on their cave walls. And it is in this spirit of loincloths and woolly mammoths brought down and mounted that I welcome Chris Bryant and Emily Thornbury for the opposition. You can enjoy that, please. <laughs> Madam President, I speak uh, for the motion before this House that the Conservative Party has been unfairly demonised. And I must say I am delighted to do so. It is fitting to do so on a day when the Prime Minister himself has announced the first full Cooperatives Act since 1965. What need of me, what need of this motion uh, when we can see such a humane and such a thoughtful conservatism in action only today? I must say there is a standard line of denunciation uh, for the Conservative Party. Uh, indeed, it is a tired litany, and I have no doubt that the excellent opposition tonight will be deploying it, and indeed spending a great deal of time uh, on this on such matters as the miners' strike and the poll tax and the phrase the nasty party and all those other things. To this one might reply by citing the extraordinary record of social and industrial legislation passed by my own party over the last two centuries. From Burke and Peel to Macmillan and Cameron, the Conservative Party has a consistent track record of reform, as we shall hear. Disraeli alone passed 11 major acts of social reform covering trades union rights, factory conditions, public health, education and housing, a generation before the Labour Party came into existence. But I don't want to suggest for a second that the Conservative Party's record is unspotted. All parties are coalitions, human beings are fallible and government is never easy. The ugly truth is that the Labour Party tends to be elected on the rare occasions when we can afford them, and then turfed out swiftly thereafter when we discover that we can't afford them. They were turfed out in 1950, in 1970, and in 1979, each after... 1951, I'm grateful for the opposition's intervention, 1951, uh, uh, in 1970 and in 1979, each after an economic crisis, and of course again in 2010. Financial crises demand tough decisions and leadership. People like it when politicians give uh, their money away and they grumble when that money is saved. So what could be easier than a kind of robotic denunciation unencumbered by thought or policy? A kind of ad hominem argument raised to the level of a party. But the truth, Madam President, goes much deeper than the normal give and take of ordinary politics. This demonization of the, po of the Tories did not happen by accident. This recent demonization was very carefully and deliberately created. And it arises, I shudder to tell you, from this very university. I'm afraid to say that that political strategy of demonization was the creation of one young strapping undergraduate from Gonville and Keyes College, a Cambridge man, no less, who put his very considerable intelligence to its service for more than a decade. That man was Alistair Campbell. Alistair Campbell understood that the press is a simple-minded beast that likes a simple line and hugely driven by fashion and the herd instinct. 
An early decision was taken to use Mrs. Thatcher as a bogey figure, sweeping away any inconvenient facts and ignoring her extraordinary achievements. Who, Madam President, created the mobile phone market and made the UK a global leader? Mobile phone being the greatest tool of technological development ever created. Who was the first politician in Britain to talk about global warming? <coughs> Mrs. Thatcher. Who was the first politician to uh, 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 um, talk about uh, the importance of spiritual values uh, in her famous Sermon on the Mount? Uh, well, it wasn't Mrs. Thatcher, but uh, it certainly was uh, aided by her extraordinary intervention. Who was the first politician to talk about <laughs> the dangers posed by the European Union? The answer Madam President, was Mrs. Thatcher. The Labour Party was transformed by Mr. Campbell into a communications machine geared to a single message. At the moment, that message is cutting too far, too fast. I wonder if that strikes a chord in this House. And a single theme, that theme, you can't trust the Tories. And then after 1997, the same person, a Cambridge man, I'm ashamed to tell you, subverted the machinery of government by removing all of the press officers who were civil servants and replacing them with party political stooges. So this tactic of demonization, this strategy of attack, is one that goes very, very deep, uh, I'm afraid. And it has been at a particular time, it was born in the middle of the 1990s, a particular target, uh, the legacy of Lady Thatcher. The rest, I will tell you, is history, and we'll be hearing more from my colleagues on this topic. But let me tell you, this was not mere political knockabout. It was a malign, and highly effective political strategy uh, who, under whose influence this country fell. It was profoundly distorting and unfair to the political record, and its effect has been disastrous because it, that strategy delivered huge majorities to the Blair and the Brown governments, which took us to war on a false prospectus in Iraq and created a financial cataclysm not seen since the 1930s and not over yet. So, in conclusion, let me say I thank you O oh, tribesmen of the primeval swaps, for sparing this woolly mammoth, at least. And I ask you to send out a strong message of your strength and independence of mind, and to support the motion. Thank you very much indeed. opportunity to talk a few truths. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be, to be up against um, three such um, outstanding members of the Conservative Party, and I'm, and I'm very pleased that they've given us um, such a, a variety of people, um, three straight white men. But there is some variety. There is some variety, because one of them didn't go to Eton. Um, <laughs> in preparing this speech because really when I looked at the topic we were supposed to be speaking I wondered how on earth I could stretch out you're having a laugh aren't you what, a, what on earth are we supposed to say to back this up it's so obvious isn't it for 10 minutes but I kind of thought about it a bit more and yes I did think about the minor strike and I did think about poll tax and I can't help it um, and I did think about Margaret Thatcher's support of apartheid. I did think about how they, how they invited uh, President Voter to London in June 8, 1984. I did remember her saying that the ANC was a typical terrorist organisation. But I thought back a bit further as well. I also thought about Peter Liu. I thought about the Tory Home Secretary, Lord Sidmouth, congratulating the army uh, for the preservation of the, peace, of, the, of the public peace when they had just shot dead 15 people and injured 70. But I also thought of, of things like Liverpool and their attitude to Liverpool, and to Boris Johnson, who was published in The Spectator, for saying that Liverpool was an excess, had an excessive predilection to welfareism, that they had created a peculiar and deeply unattractive psyche amongst many Liverpudlians. They see themselves, whenever possible, as victims and resent their victim status, yet at the same time they wallow in it. And that sort of thing, you know, there was a great deal of, of fuss about in saying things like that. But of course, in the background, and we only hear about it 30 years later, 
we hear that Sir Geoffrey Cow, the Thatcherist Chancellor, was at the same time saying, and he wrote to Mrs Thatcher to warn her of the need not to overcommit scarce resources to Liverpool. That it's regrettable that if some of the bright ideas for renewing economic activity were to be sown only on relatively stony ground on the banks of the Mersey, and that the city should be left to a managed decline. And we're told, and I, you know, I, I'm a lawyer, I, I do believe in rehabilitation, and I don't think it's fair to judge the Conservatives on Peterloo. I accept that, and I don't necessarily believe that it's fair to just judge him on the miners' strike or any of these things. So let's look at what they're doing now, because they have tried very hard to tell us that they are now caring, compassionate, bike-riding, windmill-building, hugging everything from huskies to hoodies, Conservatives, and that things have changed. And yet, let's just have a look at what, at what Cameron has said behind closed doors about Liverpool. And he said that, and he hasn't denied this, he was asked about the Hillsborough families and about their continuing to ask questions about that disaster. And he said, it's like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. Now that's what they say privately. Of course, publicly we also know that at a time when they're cutting back on local authorities, Liverpool has to sustain cuts of 8.9%. And that is at a time when, the, when you look at the top 10 councils that have suffered the worst cuts, guess what? Eight of them are Labour voting councils. They are the ones that are the poorest. If you look at, the, if you look at Manchester, hardest hit with 8% cuts, look at Trafford around the edge, a Tory voting area, and look at the cuts in place on them. They say we're all in it together. They lie. They are, we are not all in it together. This is an inept, cruel, and callous event. And of course, we are not demonising them, they are demons. And the truth is... <laughs> the truth is that they used to say that unemployment was a price, price worth, set, worth paying, and that unemployment was a byproduct of Tory policy. But actually, things have now changed, because now their policy is unemployment. They want to be able to pay back the deficit in five years. They are bonkers. You cannot pay back that deficit in five years without hitting the hardest hit already, without making the poorest pay most, and that is what is happening. But they are doing it with a smile on their face. They are doing it very charmingly. You can see Cameron, you know, who comes across in a very moderate disguise. He shows himself. He even talked today about responsible capitalism. I mean, come on. He did not get into politics in order to introduce responsible capitalism. Does anybody really believe that? But he's personable. He uses nice colloquial phrases. And it's only really at Prime Minister's questions that the mask slips. And you see the real flashman side of him and this extraordinary arrogance where he feels that he was born to rule. Well, he may think that he was born to rule, but that doesn't make it any good at it. And you just need to look at the poorest and most marginalised and the fact that their opportunities in life are being cut back. It took Labour a long time to get a million children out of poverty, but nevertheless, it will take them, as, they will take them like a, a, a click of a fingers to get those million children back into poverty again. Because in the end, those on the bottom are not the priority of this government. And it really it is for government to look after us all. And to make sure that government looks after the poorest and the weakest, perhaps more than anyone else, because they are the ones who need government on their side. And they don't have it with this government. There's somebody at the moment who is being demonised. You think of the, uh, the, 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 the guy, the captain of the Costa Concorda. You know, he's being, he's being demonised. You know, he was sailing the boat too close to the rocks. And then he was, and he was saying, I didn't, I, I, I didn't get into the lifeboat, I just fell into it. And then you think, well, actually, maybe there is a parallel between George Osborne and the captain of the Concorde. Because, of course, he was, he's been sailing our boat far too close to the rocks. And he says, oh, we're all in it together, and I just happened to fall into the lifeboat. And me and my lot are fine. And that is the difference. And then I, when I was looking at this, I just thought, I also thought, let me just kind of put the icing on the cake and talk about the potato famine. And let's talk about Robert Peel. And let's talk about the fact that he refused to repeal the Corn Laws and that for the first two years, the terrible famine, they insisted that the Irish eat inedible cornmeal. And then I remembered that actually he passed power on to Lord Russell, who was a liberal. And they continued to export during the time of the famine and they exported Irish grain. This lot may be demons, but I can say, to be fair, the Liberals are worse.
Well, thank you, uh, Madam President. This is a novel experience for me in several ways. Novel uh, because uh, I'm speaking for a full chamber. Um, <laughs> novel, novel because this is my second time at the Cambridge Union. I came once at the beginning of my time here, and I see that not much has changed, which is good as a Conservative. To see that not much has changed, apart from the introduction of unisex toilets, which I was ushered to um, by your eminent uh, deputy. Um, I'm not sure why you need unisex toilets. It takes all the fun away from being in the wrong cubicle. Um, and, <laughs> and it's novel also for me to be speaking between two uh, of my most esteemed opponents in the House uh, of Commons. And I intend, therefore, to fulfil uh, a part that has clearly been painted for me um, by uh, the honourable opponent, Emily Thornbury. Um, and that acts as a thorn between two, two roses. There is an important backdrop to this, which has been brought out by, by uh, my honourable opponent, about the history of the Conservative Party and all the wrongs that have been perpetuated. And you will have heard it many times, and many of them are quite familiar, especially for the historic examples. But I just wonder if I could read you the beginning of a white paper. Just the beginning. This government has announced that they intend to establish a comprehensive health service for everybody in the country. They want to ensure that in future every man and woman and child can rely on getting all the advice and treatment and care which they may need in matters of personal health. And it goes on to say that it shall happen free at the point of use and be comprehensive to all. Was that the 1946 health paper introduced by Nybeck? It wasn't. It was the Conservative Minister for Health in 1944 introducing the white paper for a comprehensive free health service. Much like in the same year, universal education for the first time was put in statute by Rad Butler, a Conservative Minister point. for Education. I would like to give away. Should the Conservatives vote against the establishment of the National Health Service? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad you brought that up, because you bring me neatly, neatly onto my answer, because herein lies a fundamental difference between us. Many of us, on both sides of the House of Commons, and in this chamber, no doubt, believe in many, uh, much the same principles. But it's the method of delivery. And yes, there was a 100% vote from Conservative backbenchers for the White Paper in a motion held in March 1944 for the principle of the establishment of a free NHS. But when it came in 1946, and Nye Bevan said he wanted to have a system where every single part of the provision of the health service provided by the state at that point, the Conservative Party withdrew its support for that element of the bill. And who was to prove their opposition right? Who was it who brought in private providers into the NHS and therefore shortened waiting times? Who was it who brought in the uh, diversity of care and choice? It wasn't a Conservative Prime Minister. It was Tony Blair and supported by Gordon Brown. And so in their own way, they have proved to the original opposition in 1946 to have been correct. But we need not just look at the 1944 Health White Paper or Education Act. We can look at the litany of Labour legislation, which uh, has uh, been the proudest achievement, in my view, of the Conservative Party in the 19th and 20th centuries. The Factory Act, starting in 18 1802, which were the first examples of health and safety legislation, controlling uh, the use of child labour, 16 different acts through the 19th century, at every single stage improving the lot of those who did not have the ability to speak for themselves. The Holiday with Pay Act, 1938, introduced by a Conservative minister in a national government. A, a history of social reform so considerable that it drew the praise of, of, this, of this man, who said, as a matter of hard, dry fact, from which there can be no getting away, there is more Labour legislation standing to the credit account of the Conservative Party on the statute book than there is to that of their opponents. Who said that? Who said that? It was a Republican. It was a great man. A great man who founded the Labour Party. It was Keir Hardy. And it was Keir Hardy who understood that we in the Conservative Party were the leaders in understanding that it was the right and proper duty of people who had privilege and the ability to be able to speak and had power, which was the case in the 19th century, they should use so and dispose of their talents in order 
that they may help those who do not have that privilege. And so it turns out that every single part of endeavor in our democratic state, whether it be the introduction of the Clean Air Act in 1956, the first and most important part of, um, of modern uh, legisl environmental legislation, following on from the 1872 uh, Clean Rivers Act introduced by Disraeli, at every single stage, whether it be environment or education or health or labor legislation, it has been the Conservative Party that has, by and large, not entirely, but by and large, blazed a trail. But this is not just an issue about the past and our history and the demonization of the Conservative Party. And there has been demonization, as we have heard. These are familiar tropes that we have heard this evening. It is not just a case about that. This is a matter of real and crucial and great importance. Because those moments when the Conservative Party fell down, for instance, in the uh, opposition to the rights of homosexuals, they did so, I think, for reasons which explain why uh, we have been great which is that at points we have been too close to listening to the British public. And the Labour Party has been very good at points in leading the way of being ahead of where the public is at that particular point. And the failure, therefore, of the Conservative Party, when it has failed, has not to have led. And it's been great leaders who have been able to have done that. And that is where we find ourselves today. Because there is a choice before the British public, which is one of comfortable acceptance of minimal disturbance, which in our generation, those who are 20 and 30, if we follow that path, we will end up in a situation in 20 and 30 years' time when we will not be able to afford the welfare state that we over two centuries have, have, have built up together <coughs> as a society. We will not be able to afford the comprehensive health care and education systems. We will not be able to afford these modern systems of living because we have a system which is unsuited and too expensive compared with our great competitors as they rise up at this very moment. 300,000 graduates China will turn out this year, greater than the entire university population of the United Kingdom. And we have to compete with a country with no welfare state, no education system provided by the state. These are serious matters. And to fool the British public, and to say to them we can carry on as we are, and that we can somehow do things for free and it's not going to be too difficult, and we make minimal changes, we'll close a fire station there and a class over here, and we, maybe we cut a couple of pence off the state pension, or we won't have the winter fuel allowance increased, and that somehow that will solve all the problems ahead of us. That would be to cheat everyone for years, decades. It will condemn to penury the people we are here as privileged people in this university and in this parliament that we are happy and privileged to sit in to represent. And the wiser and braver and more difficult course is to explain how hard things are and to construct a way of living which allows us to afford those things which we want to see for the common good. So I put it to you that this motion is not only essential to agree with in terms of history, in terms of logic, because if you oppose this motion, to be under no pretense, you are condemning 40% of the electorate near, nearly to being de uh, demonic, but also to our future. And it is there one, therefore one of enormous import. And I ask you to think carefully when you say that this great movement is in essence demonic, because it clearly is not, and it is the only way we are going to have salvation for our nation in the 20 or 30 years ahead. Jesse Norman is the greatest constituency MP for the last 50 years. 
I know this because I read it on his website earlier. Um, and uh, it's a great delight, as, as uh, Emily referred to, that there's such diversity on the Conservative benches tonight. Uh, not just their schooling, but, uh, I mean, one of them hasn't got a father in the House of Lords. Uh, or an uncle as well. Or, or uh, I, I, I don't know how many other members of, of, of their family in the House of Lords. But it is depressing, isn't it? when even Conservatives can't get their history right. I mean, it was pretty depressing when, when David Cameron said that America was our oldest ally. Now, you know, it's a, yeah, of course it is Portugal, yes, indeed. And, and, and Jacob obviously knows because he was there when it was signed. <laughs> yeah. but, but again tonight, you know, not even being able to remember when the Conservative Party go uh, government uh, came in again in 1951, not in 1950. Not being able to remember that the Conservatives didn't only vote against the introduction of the National Health Service in the 1940s, uh, but, but tried to sort of cover it over by, by uh, a piece of legislation that was advanced by the coalition government during the war, but more importantly voted to keep the poor law in 1947, voted to keep the poor law, which by then was the best part of 180 years old. Um, and, and I just say to Ben, who is, who is lovely, he's charming, I mean too lovely, too charming really Boy, sometimes to be a, a conservative. Yeah. If he's lovely, how can he be Well, you see, that's what you don't understand in the Conservative Party, that demons can be quite lovely. <laughs> um, but seriously, the, the, a, a point that I think Ben missed was, he was talking about um, how the, uh, you know, the Conservative Party has been so good at listening to the public, it's not managed um, to be a campaigning organisation. But I would just say to them, they've been really good at listening to the Daily Mail, and that is not the same thing as listening to the people of Britain. <laughs> Now, you need to know just a couple of things about me, but first of all, uh, first thing, uh, uh, this is a sort of confession, uh, which is that I was, uh, very briefly, a member of the Conservative Association at Oxford. I thought that might not go down very well. Um, and, uh, but, but honestly, it was just because I fancied uh, a bloke who was um, running for uh, chair of the, uh, uh, the president of the Oxford University Conservative Association who maintained for years and years that he wasn't gay because he was going to be a cabinet minister um, and, uh, and, and is now gay. Um, uh, and, um, no, I'm not going to give you his number, no. Um, and, the other thing, and the other thing you need to know is that I'm, I'm a, a, a gay ex-vicar. Now, quite often the Daily Mail says of me that I'm an ex-gay vicar, but I can assure you... <laughs> But, uh, according to my husband anyway, my, my gayness is fully intact. Um, but I just want to disagree with Jessie about, about Mrs Thatcher, just a, a, a little bit. Um, for a start, one of the, I, think, I don't think Mrs Thatcher was homophobic for an instant. Uh, she had quite a few gay men in her cabinet. There's a great story of Norman St. John Stevens going to the Royal Opera House and being in, be, be, and greeted because he, he was president of it and um, the Queen Mother arriving, uh, and um, uh, there was a large crowd outside and they applauded, and, and her saying, just think they've got two queens for the price of one. But, um, uh, but <coughs> what I do hate about Mrs Thatcher was that to get over the difficulties that she was having with a piece of legislation and to give, throw red meat for some of her backbench MPs, she, she included Clause 28 in a Local Government Finance Act, which was deliberately aimed at inciting hatred of homosexuals. And I think any political party should hang its head in shame just for that one act. I also, I, I will in just one minute then. Um, and for me personally also, because I spent part of my training to be a priest in the Church of England in, Ch in uh, Latin America and partly in Chile, uh, friends of mine were killed by Pinochet's government and I found it profoundly distressing to see Pinochet sit down for tea with Mrs Thatcher. Ben, happy to be I mean, just on, on the point of uh, the Clause 28, it was clearly a great crime. But let us not forget, my uh, predecessor, but one in the Ipswich seat, Labour Member of Parliament, gave one of the most offensive speeches in the House of Commons against homosexuality that had ever been heard in that place. So there is no monopoly of virtue on either side of the House on this issue. 
and yet, and I remember, I remember in very recent times, a man who is now a government minister, a conservative government minister, when we were having a debate on uh, smacking in the House of Commons, I was trying to intervene on him, this is Andrew Roberton, and he said, I will give way to the honourable gentleman, even though he's a notorious homosexual who will never have children of his own. That man is still a conservative member of parliament and a government minister in the Ministry of Defence. Uh, now, I, ha I have some other grievances against the Tory party, because I, I play rugby in the parliamentary rugby team. I know that's very butch for a homosexual, but um, I'm trying to prove something. And uh, well, anyway, that's true of most of my life, really. But anyway, that's another matter. Um, but, um, uh, and uh, we, we were playing last year at Twickenham, and, uh, which is even butcher, I suppose. And um, uh, there, I, there were two very large, uh, we had the ball, um, and there were two very large lads from the other side coming to, uh, uh, towards us. And the person in, as the inside centre was Carl McCartney, a Conservative MP. And at the very last moment, he passed the ball to me, whereupon these two men landed on top of me and broke my leg. So I have a personal grievance against the Tory party. <laughs> breaking my leg. Um, now, I have some more substantial, obviously, complaints. Um, though breaking your leg's quite high up there. But uh, first of all, it's the ruthlessness, the sheer and utter ruthlessness of conservatism. And we've seen it since the general election. First of all, what was one of the first things they decided to do? Let's reorganise all the constituency boundaries in this country to give a partisan advantage to the Conservative Party. That legislation's gone through. Lots of um, members are now unhappy about it because every seat in the country is being changed. But that was deliberately designed to, that was deliberately designed to try and give a, a, a partisan advantage. Another one? I will give you his number, honestly. I'm going to ask whether this move on to what you're doing in the House. Uh, well, actually, technologically, just completely and utterly inaccurate. The only reason that we get more seats for the same number of votes uh, is because we have a much lower turnout in strong Labour areas but still win the seat. Uh, I'm afraid that you're, you're meant to be one of the intellectuals. You should understand this much better, uh, Jesse. Uh, and secondly, then, there's the issue of what they're doing in the Lords. 179 new members of the House of Lords and another 60 to come in the next few weeks. I mean, there are already far too many members of the House of Lords, so they're adding more unelected people so as to drive through unpopular policies like the, new, the changes to the NHS, which will mean that up to 49% of, of hospital beds in every hospital in England will be able to be run by the private sector and provided privately rather than uh, publicly to drive through that policy and to drive through the reforms to welfare, some of which will hurt some of the most vulnerable people in this country more than anybody else. They've had to bung more and more people in the unelected chamber uh, whilst cutting the number of members of parliament in the elected chamber. Now that is just ruthless. Sheer and utter ruthlessness. There's part of me that admires it, but it's the part that's demonic. And then, there's, and then there's the balmy obsession with the EU. The complete, I mean, if you ring, there's a little bell you can ring somewhere in Parliament, I'm sure, which goes EU, 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 and suddenly every Tory MP is in the chamber. Half of them frothing at the mouths, uh, the, other, the others dabbing each other's chins. Um, and, and it's just extraordinary. And, and, and why, I, and that is, and you can see the eyes. The eyes just go slightly weird. Just slightly weird. And that's, that is the demon eyes. That is the demon eyes moment. Um, um, I have one minute remaining. That's great. Good. So I can skirt through uh, what the Tories did to my constituency in the Rhondda, the mining valleys of South Wales, when people were chucked off uh, out of work and chucked not onto um, uh, work benefits, but chucked onto sickness benefits, uh, because that helped the, um, the figures. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about youth unemployment now. The number of people unemployed in this country over the, under the age of 24 for more than six months has doubled in the last year. Doubled. And I fear that there's going to be a whole generation of people who will never even get their first job. And the scars that that will create in many parts of this country, it will be very difficult to undo. Um, but, but my biggest complaint, really, is that they... Well, I'll tell you a story. 
I was at the theatre. This is a completely true story. I was at the theatre, unlike some of the other ones. Uh, I was at the theatre a couple of years ago, and uh, it was a boring play. But just before we were about to sit, as we were sitting down, the play was about to start, there was a couple who'd obviously had a big row. And the woman, just as the lights were going down, turned to him and said, the worst of it all is you're so bloody patronising. And he turned to her and kissed her on the forehead and said, it's patronising, dear. <laughs> and in the end, that's what really gets my goat about the Tory party. They're just so bloody patronising. <laughs> that's the demonic element. Uh, my final point of all is just three words. Andrew... Lloyd Webber, <laughs> a Conservative peer. <laughs>the uh, propositions, I think, misappropriation of history. Um, essentially, the history of the parties is something we can't do anything about, you know, that's not going to change. But I'm worried that you view 1951 as such an appalling time of financial crisis, and I think that that shows the Conservative Party's focus on money. That was, one of the end of, that was the end of one of the periods of most innovative social legislation this country has ever seen, and yet you view it as a crisis point for this country. That's the government which created the NHS, the government which ended the poor law. I mean, it's a very, very socially limited government. I think your focus on the budget deficit at the end of that period really did, betrays a lack of concern for people and a frank focus with money.
where a Labour council is sitting on an investment fund, and instead of, instead of spending that fund on public services, it is cutting so that it can blame the government. Don't demonise them to the cuts, demonise them for other things. I'm from Gonville and Keys. Uh, before I make my point, I just want to say that this debate is about the Conservative Party rather than the Labour Party, so it would be great if we should stick to that. Uh, but this is kind of odd for me because I'm a, a member of the Labour Party and a lifelong opponent of the Conservatives. But I also think that I'd much rather see incompetence and stupidity instead of evil. And I don't really want to imagine the three gentlemen sitting there are the embodiment of Satan himself. But I do think that if you look at the, what's going on now in the economy, growth stagnating, with uh, unemployment going up, and various other things like that, that what we've got is a government, a party that doesn't really know what they're doing, that is, that is following uh, the wrong policies, that is out of touch with the people, as in the anecdote of the uh, statement about the council state there, and I, I don't think that's evil, and I don't think it's right to demonise them for it, but I do just think it's a little bit incompetent.
Hello. Well, well. Uh, I think the most uh, crazy thing for me in terms of why I see why it's fine to demonise the Conservatives is the willing of these people here to misrepresent and distort the past. I mean, it's it's only there are only very few of us who can study uh, you know the last two hundred years in detail as historians. But if you have, you'll be aware that their representation of the 19th century as an era of reform by conservative governments is completely uh, missing the point that it's against vested conservative interests and landowners that those reforms are being pushed forward. And to present Churchill as, uh, well, sorry, to present the Tories in the early 1940s, moreover, as a force for change, for social reform, the NHS, etc., is completely ludicrous because the Tories were extremely reluctant and grudging in their support of the NHS, and that's, you know, I think that's pretty known with that. Uh, and then just lastly, to, to point out the 1938 holiday with pay act, uh, it's completely ludicrous when there are millions of people in the 30s who were uh, impoverished, starving, without access to healthcare, etc., time of mass unemployment, and so to pick out one single issue is just a complete distortion uh, and failure to recognise what really matters. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I think, again, picking up on this idea of um, sort of historical distortion, um, both sides, I think, don't seem willing to accept, though, that the Conservative Party of the 1950s, certainly the Conservative Party of Harold Macmillan, although it may have been full of old Etonian buffers who spent most of their time in the Grouse Moor, uh, is a totally different party to the party we have now. Um, Yes, it is, you know, it's been softened around the edges since the days of Mrs. Thatcher, but it is essentially a Thatcherite party. Uh, those who wear the old Etonian tie who are with us this evening uh, owe far more of uh, their political allegiance and views to her um, sort of canon uh, as opposed to that of Harold Macmillan. Um, and I, I, I think that, uh, you know, we have to be very clear in, in dividing the two. That I think the thing is that most people here demonise um, Thatcherism and uh, the, that the Conservative Party that she uh, formed and created and not the um, more traditional uh, party uh, that existed uh, beforehand. But in 
this that is not optimized. There is an equality of facts, isn't there? Because they say we're the devil, and I say there is a day of Russia. Or at least they fire in the Yeah, 
if you wanted to speak, I don't know, get quick on the but in less. Anyway, somebody there, will you hold it up, please? And will we see? Watch carefully. Do any of us disappear in the clouds? They have not disappeared in the clouds, fading in front of the Madam President. We must therefore support the motion. <laughs> to you because getting five members of parliament in the same room in the Union Chamber is something that's already seen. I think what we can say is that it's been a, an interesting debate so far, so well done to you for managing to corral them all at, at this time. Uh, I should have begun actually by saying, Dear Dwee, August Commuter Falsha, Mr. Rees Mogg, that's just some deployment of the Irish Gaelic to assure you that I'm not actually a Russian communist spy. Um, I was actually born on these isles, uh, just to, to put your nervousness at rest. Um, the terms of this debate tonight have been whether the Conservatives have been unfairly demonised. Now, there were a couple of reasons why I actually hesitated to speak in this debate tonight. Firstly, is that I would have defined demonised as unfairly portrayed in the manner of a demon. Now, I don't actually genuinely believe that Jacob, for instance, is genuinely an agent of Satan. I think that is probably an overreaction. <laughs> Um, <laughs> nevertheless, like, there's a certain inherent tautology in the motion. Um, it's also actually, unfortunately, quite a partisan debate. You know, on this side, we've two Labour MPs. On that side, we've got three Conservative MPs. I think it's telling, actually, that there are no Liberal Democrats proposing the motion. I would have thought that it might have been up to them to discharge some patriotic duty in defending the coalition that they continue to support. Obviously, none of them fancied turning up for the slaughter that would have ensued. <laughs> um, the, for some bizarre reason, I've been asked to stand here tonight and close the debate with the stronger cases I can make for why you should be putting on this side of the motion. And one of the reasons I did decide to speak was hopefully to give another dimension. Um, I made the point about partisanship. I've never voted Labour. Oh, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. Um, and so I hopefully will not be bringing exactly the same kind of tussle which we've seen. And I think my opening point, therefore, is that it's not sufficient rebuttal to the point about something the Conservatives have done wrong to simply say, well, aren't Labour crap? That is not the terms of the motion. We're talking about the Conservative Party and I'm going to be coming on to discuss the Labour Party and how they have changed and the Conservatives have not. And that is one reason why you should be on this side of the House. So this shouldn't be a question of falling into one camp or the next. I did pause to think about the meaning of the word demonisation in this motion. And and I realise that actually it's not referring to a person, it's referring to a group. So my first point, and I'm going to come to some rebuttal of what's been said, my first point is to remind the House that the Conservative Party as a group, which is what we're debating here, is not the government. It's a very different collection of individuals. Cameron is most decidedly, and even some of the opponents on that side will agree, a liberal lefty Tory who was tactically installed to appeal to the centre ground and doesn't occupy that much space in the mainstream Conservative Parliamentary Party. And all of the aggression towards the government that we've got, a government whose greatest hits include, and this is not limited, the complete thrashing of higher education, an unjust and ill-thought-through welfare reform, cuts to legal aid, trying to sell off the national forests, the abject failure to engage in constructive discussion with the Scottish nationalists, all of that, that's the left wing of the Conservative Party governing with the Liberal Democrats. As has been evidenced in this debate, the position we might have been in if we had had a Conservative majority government beholden to its backbenchers on social issues, on Europe, on public spending, on welfare, we would all have been likely to have been in a much worse situation and in a situation which is much, much more terrible for the average British person. Because the truth is that the guts of the Conservative Party are still the Section 28ers, the MPs who have seats for life and trounce meaningful parliamentary reform, the MPs who think that immigration is a dirty word, 
The MPs who get parachuted into safe seats, like the Dean Dorries, who actually said that the reason for an increase in child sex abuse was a lack of abstinence education in schools. That's the face of the Conservative Party as it still stands. And so we can easily vote against this motion on simply those grounds, the vision of a government inhabited by those people, rather than the fluffy, useful idiots of the Liberal Democrats, justifies the harsh sensibilities of the motion. But I'll come to some of the rebuttal um, on what the other members have said. Jesse made some interesting comments on thoughtful conservatism, referenced a lot of the historical Tories, which was nice. He mentioned that if the Tories are taking tough decisions. I mean, the truth of the matter is that all politicians of every party in every time have always taken tough decisions. Gordon Brown made a tough decision to sell all the nation's gold at rock bottom prices, just as David Cameron is taking tough decisions on any issue that he's ever asked about. Um, <laughs> Emily gave a really, really impressive and compelling argument about the failures of the current government, which I'm not going to rehash because I think it was such a good, such a good speech. She touched on, on the spectacular genocide of a million of my countrymen in the Irish famine, which I thought was a thoughtful point. Thank you very much for making it. Um, but I, we're not here. I'll, I'll let that slide. We're not here to rehash history. Um, then I can happily tell you that the unisex tubules may have gone, um, but the esteemed officers of this union continue to somehow find themselves in the wrong cubicle at the wrong time. That's a tradition which is still warmly maintained. Um, he did mention the NHS and, and, and the supposed white paper that was created during the 1940-45 government, of course, that was the national government of all the parties. Clement Dattley was deputy prime minister, he was basically running domestic policy at the time, so Labour could deserve at least some credit for that. Um, apart from that, I think the only overlasting memory of his speech is the Factory Act of 1802, which to my mind strikes me as saying that not, not a lot has happened in the intervening 210 years, just putting it out there. Um, but he touched on a much more serious point, which is what I'm going to expand on in depth. He mentioned that China is producing every year 300,000 graduates. And it makes me reflect, as I have to reflect, because I'm the only person in this debate who could allegedly be said to have some specialist knowledge of the subject, on higher education. And despite the fact that there are some actually quite compelling right-wing arguments, as well as left-wing arguments, in favour of the state funding of higher education as a means of developing a citizenry and a workforce which is actually equipped to deal with the needs of the 21st century society, um, which other countries are reacting to and developing, putting money into and reaping the benefits of such um, labour. But the Tories are now continuing and completely refusing to change course on a complete and utter demonisation of the higher education sector. The very idea that it is in any way compassionate or is in any way a correct thing to do to dump 60 to 70,000 pounds of debt on a medical student or 30 or 40,000 pounds of debt on any other kind of student in this climate, in this global situation and with these economic pressures is frankly ludicrous and I think if they don't take that away from this debate they have been very, very, very stupid. <laughs> Chris made quite a good singing attack of conservatism. Um, he reminds us of his days in the OECA whenever sort of sexual liaisons led him sort of to join the OECA and get involved. I could, well, oh, it's very shame because I, those things still go on, so, you know, plus a change. Um, but he made an interesting point, he was interrupted on in that point um, about homosexuality, so I'll touch on that. There's a good point there, but the point that was missed by, by the, the proposition on that side is that Labour changed its position on homosexuality, it changed its position on Section 28, on its position on civil partnerships. Popular opinion changed. And the Tory party applied a veneer of moderacy to itself. Whenever David Cameron went into the last election, he was on the cover of Gay Times, he gave a very gushing interview. Um, but that veneer of moderacy isn't actually the parliamentary Conservative Party as currently constituted, or even as the Conservative Party continues to want it to be constituted. I don't actually believe that you're the only three straight men left in the Tory party, much as I would love to believe that's the case. Well, <laughs> fair point, fair point. So, I suppose if you're considering, if you're, trying, if you're still trying to weigh up the options whether you should vote for or against this motion, reflect back onto what the Tory party is trying to say that it's become. Reflect on the fact that a lot of what we have seen from the Conservative Party is still an attempt to curry public opinion. 
by applying effectively its radical left wing as the mainstream of the party. And we've seen in recent times that that's being increasingly stretched. So there was the potential for a massive rebellion on what was actually an insanely regressive abortion amendment. There was a massive rebellion on Europe. I saw on the Independent there's going to be potentially a massive rebellion on the Liberal Democrats' attempts to legalise gay marriage. And the fact of the matter is that in the last 20 years, the Conservative Party has moved almost nowhere in its totality, while the rest of public opinion has shifted up and down and left and right. And it is unfortunate because more and more young people are saying in opinion polls that they will never vote Conservative. And there are some people who think that's a great thing, they think it will lead to permanent centre-left government, but I think it's a bad thing. I think it's a bad thing that we do not have a party beyond Labour, that it not even a party anymore, beyond Labour, who don't actually speak to a generation of young people in any meaningful sense. It's as important that we get good Tories elected by demonising those within the party who continue to be the obstacles to change, the obstacles to social reform, and the obstacles to the changing times, than it is we elect someone of another party. So, if you support anyone other than the Conservatives, you should be voting against this motion purely to register that fact. But if you are a Conservative, you should, I hope, be voting against this motion on the grounds that the Conservative Party you want it to be, the Conservative Party that you want to win par, is not the Conservative Party as it stands, and cannot be the Conservative Party as it stands. Remember that when you walk through the aisles. And if you've walked no, you've been making the right decision tonight. Thank you for listening.